Um, so it's now my great pleasure to welcome to, to the podium the Honourable Tanya Plibersek, MP, uh, who is the Shadow Minister for Foreign Affairs and International Development, Deputy Leader of the Opposition and Deputy Leader of the Federal Parliamentary Labour Party and Federal Member for Sydney. Uh, you have all the other details in your um, packs and so, so we can have more time for speech and questions. I welcome the Shadow Minister. Uh, thank you so much for that introduction, Zara. And I want to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on today, the Ngunnawal people and the Ngambri people, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Of course, I'd also like to acknowledge the special guests that are with us today, the Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs for Security and Multilateral Issues from the Czech Republic, the Ambassador of the Argentine Republic and the Dean of the Diplomatic Corps, uh, other ambassadors, high commissioners, our own diplomats, of course, past and present, uh, and other officials who are here. Uh, John McCarthy, who is the national president of the Australian Institute of International Affairs, uh, and to all of you uh, engaged in putting on this uh, very well attended conference today. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Uh, all of you, I'm sure, have thought a great deal about what Kofi Annan has called problems without passports, problems which are transnational, even global. They are problems which threaten our peace, threaten our prosperity, the health of our people and our planet. And they are problems which require the cooperation of nations to solve. Indeed, we can only solve them if we work domestically and regionally and globally. In facing these problems without passports, we have a threefold task. Firstly, each nation must take necessary action within its own borders. The intensifying effect on global extremism of Iraq and Syria's inability to deal with Daesh is an example of failure in one state having an effect on all. Secondly, of course, regional partners must act effectively together. There was a time when Solomon Islands appeared to be in danger of becoming a failed state. The countries of the Pacific Islands Forum responded with the Regional Assistance Mission to Solomon Islands, Ramsey, with participation from every Pacific Island Forum country and led by Australia. Over 12 years, Ramsey has seen law and order restored national institutions rebuilt, and Solomon Islands economy reformed. And thirdly, of course, the global community must work together. Smallpox, which killed hundreds of millions of people in the 20th century alone, was completely eradicated by the World Health Organization's smallpox eradication program in a patient and determined 14-year international campaign. There are many examples of these problems without passports, health epidemics, the current displacement of a record 60 million people worldwide by war and conflict, natural disasters and economic crises like the global financial crisis. Today I'm going to talk about one in particular and that's climate change. Climate change presents undeniable risks to our own country to our neighbours and to the world. In Australia, both extreme fire weather and extreme sea level events have increased. The $5 billion Great Barrier Reef tourism industry is already worrying about the impacts of coral bleaching and increased frequency and severity of storms and cyclones. From 2020 onwards, the predicted increase in drought frequency is estimated to cost $7.3 billion annually, reducing our GDP by 1%. In the Pacific, all of the land area of the Marshall Islands and Tuvalu, and 97% of the land area of Kiribati is less than five metres above sea level. Tuvalu Prime Minister, Enele Sopo-Agu, said last year that climate change was, quote, like a weapon of mass destruction. In the broader Asian region, countries are experiencing declining food security, water shortages, 
increased prevalence and geographic reach of disease. We see that ourselves uh, in the northern parts of Australia. And more extreme weather events, including floods and cyclones. The United Nations estimates that without action, worldwide economic losses from natural disasters will double by 2030 to $200 billion each year. Estimates for the potential number of climate refugees range upwards from 75 million, potentially uh, um, even greater than the number of people uh, already displaced today, record numbers. If we are seeing the world struggle with mass movements of people now, it's not um, difficult to imagine how much greater the challenge will be with another 75 million displaced. So just as the consequences of these complex challenges cross countries, cross regions and cross global community, so do the solutions. We can't ask others to do what we are not prepared to do ourselves. As Dr Michael Fullerlove argued in one of his recent Boyer lectures, talking specifically about climate change, good foreign policy begins at home. We can't expect our relationships with other countries to thrive if we are complacent about a threat which affects us all. This is as true of climate change as it is of something like Ebola. A foreign policy approach that looks beyond the next budget or the next election and plans for the next decade or the next century must see that credible action on climate change in Australia is as important to our global relationships and future security as any other issue. We need to do better domestically. Our government has repealed the carbon price. It's tried to shut down the Clean Energy Finance Corporation and this year tried to ban it from investing in wind and solar. It's tried to axe the Australian Renewable Energy Agency and did abolish the Climate Commission and has tried to abandon the renewable energy target. Australia's largest energy and emissions market analyst, Reputex, has confirmed that under current policy settings, carbon pollution levels from Australia's biggest polluters will increase by 20% by 2030. And for the hard-nosed realists in the room, which I'm sure is all of you, the cost of shirking our national responsibilities is measured in Australian dollars and Australian jobs. <coughs> Last year, investment in renewables dropped by 88% in Australia, while it grew by 16% around the world. Since the last election, the ABS has found that about 15% of jobs in the renewable sector have vanished. Labor's recent announcement of a 50% renewable energy target by 2030 is proof of our determination to seize back that opportunity and to meet our national responsibilities along the way. Dr Fullerlove also points to the missed opportunities for Australia by failing to act as a leader on climate change, both regionally and globally. He says a generation ago, perhaps even a decade ago, Australia might have led the world in finding a market solution for the problem of reducing emissions. It was the kind of thing that we did well. Just as Australia must act on climate change at home to credibly call for action abroad, we must act in our region to credibly call for action globally. In the Pacific, our responsibility could not be more pronounced. We are the greatest per capita emitter in the world, and the Pacific Island countries are, as the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon said earlier this month, on the front line of climate change. Just as our responsibilities at the regional scale are great, so are our opportunities. Over $2.5 trillion is expected to be invested in renewables in the Asia-Pacific region up to 2030. Australia has a strong record of engaging with our region, including with institutions like ASEAN. We have the clear avenue to be part of a constructive dialogue through the Pacific Islands Forum. The Pacific Islands Forum Secretariat is engaged in multi-stakeholder efforts to harness available climate change financial aid in effective and informed ways. 
aid effectiveness and capacity building is an area where we have excelled. We should make more of this opportunity for leadership rather than cracking jokes about the desperate plight of our neighbours. And after the uh, unfortunate incident recently where our Minister for Immigration and Border Protection was caught uh, unaware by a boom mic, the President of Kiribati said it shows a sense of moral irresponsibility quite unbecoming of leadership in any capacity. I find it extremely sad, extremely disappointing that we are making jokes about a very serious issue. He said of Australia and New Zealand, we expect them as bigger brothers, not bad brothers, to support us on this one because our future depends on it. The moral damage that Australia, the reputational damage that Australia suffers by being viewed as irresponsible in this area hurts more than simply our ability to effectively advocate for and shape a response to climate change. It limits our influence in regional and multilateral institutions where we've previously played a very strong role, advancing our interests. And the more recalcitrant we are, or we seem to be, the more difficulty we'll have in the future negotiating regional and global changes as economic and military centres of gravity shift. Of course, a problem like climate change demands more than a domestic response and more than a regional response. It's a global challenge that can only effectively met, be met by global action. We know already that thoughtful, patient responses to complex global problems can succeed beyond our wildest optimism. The World Health Organization campaigns that have eliminated smallpox and are on the brink of eliminating polio are just one such example. Just think about it for a minute. Smallpox killed hundreds of millions of people in the 20th century. It's gone. Polio, which stalked Australia so recently that our current ambassador to the United States and your next president, Kim Beasley, still has a vivid memory of waking up one morning unable to move, has been eradicated from the Western world and is on the brink of being eradicated worldwide. The number of cases worldwide dropped from 350,000 cases in 125 countries in 1988. I'd just finished high school. Last year, 2014, there were just 359 cases. An AIDS-free generation is in sight. The Millennium Development Goals have lifted more than a billion people out of poverty since 1990. And we've already seen the global community come together on the issue of climate change. In 1988, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change was established. In 1997, the Kyoto Protocol was adopted, the world's first greenhouse gas emissions reduction treaty, and the first action of the Rudd government in 2007 was to ratify Kyoto. Today, partly driven by those negotiations, emissions trading policies are in place for around 1 billion people and more than 40% of the world economy. And when China's recently announced emissions trading scheme starts in 2017, around 2 billion people and around 40% of the world's carbon emissions will be covered. The 2015 United Nations Climate Change Conference is next month. Australia has a proud history of shaping international agreements from the founding of the UN onwards. In Paris, Australia has the opportunity to push for strong and credible action on climate change, and we should. Right now, we're seen of something as a laggard on climate change. In fact, a report by the Africa Progress Panel described Australia as a free rider on global efforts. The world is perplexed that even as the international community moves in one direction, Australia is moving in the opposite direction. The ETS, which data shows was working, was dismantled, and emissions, predictably, from the electricity sector have gone up. 
Problems without passports continue to challenge us and climate change, of course, is just one of them. And yet it underscores two essential points. Firstly, being part of regional and global communities involves both opportunities and responsibilities. But if you don't meet your responsibilities, you miss out on the opportunities. Because every community is a network of long-term relationships whose foundation is reciprocity and respect. Although the questions change, we return to those same relationships, the same regional communities, the same multilateral institutions, time and time again. Our early diplomatic approach in China in the 1970s opened the door to a relationship which has developed and strengthened over decades. The strategic partnership between Australia and China negotiated by the Gillard government is one example and chapter is another. When Labor was last in government, we launched the Australia in the Asian Century White Paper, which made sure our changing regional dynamics were considered in every aspect of government decision making and allowed us to seize those regional opportunities. We matched strategic thinking with concrete investment in our relationships with the global community by doubling our aid program and expanding our diplomatic footprint. We were grateful to be supported by many of our neighbours in our bid to join the UN Security Council. The second lesson is that increasingly policy making at the national, regional and global levels cannot be separated from one another. Taking another example, Labor's ambition for a growing Australian economy to be uh, expressed in recent years by both our strong support for the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and the elevation of the G20 during the global financial crisis. We understand that these engagements are complementary, not contradictory. I began by quoting Kofi Annan, the former Secretary General, and um, I want to leave you with a few thoughts about the most recent, uh, um, my most recent trip to uh, New York, to the UN. When I was there just last month, we saw the world come together to set a new agenda for addressing some of the most persistent problems, with 193 nations adopting the Sustainable Development Goals. The current Secretary General, said that these global goals compel nations to, and I quote, look beyond national boundaries and short-term interests and act in solidarity for the long term. Meeting these global goals will take action at home. We need to be prepared to measure our success against these global targets, both our domestic success and our contribution to the success of the global goals internationally. We must meet our aid obligations, and in our region, Australia has a responsibility by both capacity and proximity to take a leadership role. Working with the international community in multilateral partnerships, our role is also global. We can't step up the scale of our ambition if we start from shaky domestic or regional foundations. The global goals, like any other international challenge, can only be met through coordinated efforts on all of these levels, domestic, regional and global. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Pepesek. Now, I understand that you have 10 minutes before you have to leave. Would you like to take the questions here or would you like... You'll go back. Okay. Um, so I think we'll just start with two questions where we can get the microphone um, uh, placed. Um, I'm not seeing any hands up yet. Where are all those young people from yesterday? Ah. Sue Boyd, you're the first, okay. Have we got a second one? Uh, Alison Roboxi, you'll be second, okay, thank you. Um, uh, I'm Sue Boyd from the Institute in Western Australia in Perth. Um, thank you very much for your address. It's very interesting the way you've covered the, 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 the both regional and global challenges. I'd like to ask you about um, what you're thinking about and a really an emerging challenge, which is the threat to existing sovereign national borders, which has been posed by the unprecedented migration of thousands of people across borders in a totally uncontrolled way, um, particularly causing enormous challenges for the countries of Europe. But also, I would suggest, 
uh, presenting enormous challenges for us, notwithstanding the fact that our borders are sea borders rather than land borders. Would you like to comment on that? Thank you. Uh, it, it's obviously um, an issue that is compelling the attention of policymakers and governments around the world. Uh, 60 million people displaced from their homes by conflict, natural disaster, uh, in our own region, if you look at uh, countries like Myanmar uh, and the number of Rohingya refugees leaving because of the discrimination, poverty and other issues that are driving them from their homes. Um, I think uh, we do need to... Um, uh, I think the first, and, um, the first and most important effort we need to make is to uh, provide much greater support in countries of first asylum than we're doing as a global community right now. Uh, I think the fact that the World Food Programme, for example, has cut its uh, support per person in uh, Lebanon um, from $30 US per person per month for food assistance to $13.50 per person per month in food assistance uh, in the last discussions I had with them shows the scale of the problem. So countries uh, like Australia that are uh, able to contribute to supporting people in countries of first asylum should do more. There are also countries that are contributing virtually nothing to the humanitarian intake, uh, to the humanitarian efforts in um, the region uh, and in countries of first asylum like Lebanon, Jordan uh, and Turkey, if you're talking about the Syrian conflict and the Iraq conflict. And the second thing we need to do, of course, is um, continue to invest uh, in economic growth uh, in countries where you're seeing large numbers of economic um, migrants leaving. Uh, there's no um, simple or quick solution to doing that, but we see that one of uh, the great drivers is conflict. We support international institutions um, to help manage uh, uh, immediate relief to those people. Um, secondly, we need to uh, focus on economic development in countries that have large numbers of economic migrants. The question of how we deal with dissolving borders in a geopolitical sense is a much more complex one. And I, I don't think um, if we spent the whole of the rest of this conference talking about that one issue uh, alone that we would get a satisfactory um, medium to long-term answer on the geographical uh, um, challenges and the geopolitical challenges of those shifting borders, not just in the Middle East, but predominantly in the Middle East right now. Mr. Plibersek, Alison Bronowski, you will have heard the minister this morning saying that, uh, stressing that Australia respects the rule of law internationally, expects other countries to do the same, and at the same time criticising the Russians for their role in Ukraine. I wonder if you could comment on the legality of our current deployment in Syria and indeed in Iraq. Under what provision of international law are Australian forces deployed there? And if there is none, that is to say, a Security Council resolution or immediate threat to Australia or an improper formal invitation from the government of either of those countries to Australia to be there, what is the legality of our deployment? Um, I actually didn't hear the uh, Foreign Minister's comments. I came in halfway through her speech, so but I'll, I'll answer the general uh, question that you've given. I think there is a legal basis for Australia's um, uh, response to a request from the government of Iraq to assist it to protect its territory and its people uh, from uh, IS, or Daesh, whatever you want to call it. Um, there's a, a clear request and a response to that request. Uh, in relation to the, um, the uh, overflight uh, missions in Syria, uh, I think that uh, you can make a case that as the Syrian government is unable and unwilling to prevent attacks being launched uh, from its territory, uh, on the territory and the people of Iraq, that there is also a legal basis there. I am actually very concerned, however, about the um, lack of articulation of a long-term strategy in this, uh, in this question. 
And in fact, um, the reason I need to go at exactly 10 past is because at half past 10 this morning, I'll be speaking in the mm -hmm. parliament on a motion that I have proposed um, asking for uh, an, uh, um, a, a debate in the parliament, just as we debated uh, the engagement in Iraq in the past in the parliament. I indeed, uh, in one of the previous debates, all 150 members of the House of Representatives spoke. We have not had such a debate in the parliament um, on this engagement. And the reason I believe it should happen is because it is not clear what the long-term strategy is. The government has uh, named a number of reasons that it's engaged uh, in Iraq. The first, and I think the defensible one, is that we've been asked for, by the government of Iraq to help it defend its territory and its people. The attacks are brutal. Uh, Daesh would have claimed more territory, would have slaughtered more uh, um, people if it had had the opportunity. This is a brutal force. Uh, there is no question that um, that uh, defending minorities uh, in Iraq is a worthwhile thing to do. Um, the entry of the Russians uh, into Syria, uh, attacking not just Daesh, but also, it seems, any organisation that is opposed to uh, President Assad, who um, it is reported has killed more than 200,000 of his own people, uh, is a great concern. The use of um, barrel bombs uh, by the Russians, their rules of engagement, uh, which do not reflect the same um, concern for civilian casualties as our rules of engagement concern me deeply. And we're in a situation now where it, it, we're, we're reading the tea leaves uh, on the government's intention with uh, softening language about the role that President Assad would play. I, I don't know... I don't know where the government believes this is going and this should be discussed in our national parliament, not so that I know, so that the Australian people know that the government has put thought into what happens next. One of the great tragedies of Iraq was the, uh, not the, uh, the immediate aftermath of the military defeat of Saddam Hussein debartification, the demobilisation of the army uh, contributed a great deal to the um, post-conflict instability that Iraq has faced. And we need to know that there isn't an equivalent um, disaster zone for Syria. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I am sorry, I have to leave, but I actually have to be in the chamber at 10.30. Thank so you so much, uh, Shadow Minister, for when you're so busy. Now, don't...